we are with IBIG in online meeting, and this is uh, we can uh, with allow, uh, all of us together, and there is a good foster bonding between the IBIG and the EPSA. And we have the pleasure today that we have the president of the IBIG, Professor Holger Tell. Uh, actually, uh, before we start, we have to uh, say that uh, our uh, last, we missed our uh, friend, Professor Hisham Sakit, uh, that we have uh, one of the first of the Egyptian doctors that have been passed away during COVID-19 because his uh, main interest along the time with us usually was for the education and the training of the uh, MIS. His role cannot be forgotten. And this is with uh, Dr. Eigen. Uh, and actually, uh, today, this is the look of uh, my friend, Holger. He is looking at that time to the future, which we are now, and we can see him in a few minutes. And uh, our first presentation today, we have the, our eminent pediatric pulmonologist in Egypt, Professor Nader Fasih, Professor of Pediatric Pulmonology and Head of Pediatric Pulmonology Unit in Alexandria University, one of the uh, eminent pulmonologists in the region, and he is a pioneer of the interventional bronchology. And uh, he is different because he is unique, making a very uh, good uh, meeting in the Bibliotheca Alexandrina, up to 4,000 people attending. And I will let all of you admire his presentation regarding the congenital lung lesions. It's yours, Professor Nader, now, please. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, all my colleague, um, Professor Dr. Samah Shahata, Dr. Shri, for this uh, nice introduction uh, about um, uh, about me, but actually, uh, I hope to be uh, to the point, and I hope to be uh, um, uh, tasked to the point, uh, which is today my presentation is about bronchopulmonary malformations. Definitely, bronchopulmonary malformations um, are being detected during this, during the last years, with increasing frequency. However, this may be due to uh, uh, an advantage or advances in the prenatal and perinatal imaging techniques. And the bronchopulmonary malformations as a presentation, definitely we have a very wide range of presentation ranging from just silent and incidental finding due to, due to uh, routine X-ray or CT scan, or it may be severe and life-threatening, which may need urgent and urgent surgical intervention. Uh, the task already, as we can see here, that bronchopulmonary malformation are um, often discussed as congenital cystic lesions, which may or may not cystic, definitely. And it includes a variety of different morphologies uh, and definition with different classifications. But nowadays, till now, we have no standardized criteria definitions or terminology bridging disciplines which involve it in the diagnosis or um, care and the prevention of this disease. And actually fetal ultrasound is altering our understanding of these lesions. Uh, for sure that um, the pathogenesis is due to defective either budding, differentiation or separation from the uh, primitive for gut. And we have a very huge spectrum of bronchopulmonary malformations. First of all, is the for gut abnormal abnormalities like bronchogenic cyst, uh, tracheoesophageal fistula, esophageal or neuroenteric cyst. Or the airway anomalies like uh, tracheal atresia, bronchial atresia, or tracheal bronchus. Or vascular abnormalities like pulmonary sting, alveolar capillary dysplasia, or pulmonary isomeries. The last point is the uh, parenchymal abnormalities, which include pulmonary agenesis or hypoplasia, congenital lobar overinflation, congenital pulmonary airway malformation, and the bronchopulmonary sequestration. Bronchopulmonary malformations, now we are discussing about um, five points. The first is the bronchogenic cyst. Secondary is the bronchial atresia. Third issues with uh, congenital pulmonary 
airway malformations, and then congenital lobar overinflation. And the last point is the bronchopulmonary sequestration. However, this is a review of 306 patients um, in uh, many um, uh, centers worldwide. And we can see here that the uh, prevalence of congenital lobar overinflation, congenital pulmonary airway malformation, bronchogenic cyst, and the bronchopulmonary sequestrations are more or less equal in prevalence between each other. But actually, the um, bronchial atresia is much less common as a frequency than the other lesions. And in one of our studies in Egypt, in Alexandria here, we can see here a collection of 166 cases uh, between 2007 and 2015. And we can see here that uh, congenital lobar overinflation and the congenital pulmonary airway malformations are the most prevalent finding in our hospital. And then we get bronchopulmonary sequestrations bron uh, and uh, bronchogenic cyst are about 50% less than the prevalence of the congenital lobar overinflation and the congenital pulmonary airway malformation. And the least is the bronchial atresia. However, the incident rate ratio was found to be about 1.17. It means that we have a 17% annual increase in the prevalence of these lesions world, uh, between 2007 and 2015. But taking in consideration that we have a very high uh, birth rate in our country, so we are changing by putting the Poisson um, uh, module that we can say that we can find that the corrected ratio is 1.15. It means that we have an annual increase by about 15% each, each year. And uh, also in a review of 52 cases, we can see here that most of the lesions are present in the left upper uh, in about 20, in about 50% of these cases. And the less common is the left lower lobe uh, and so both of them considering about more than 75% of the cases. The development of these lesions usually may be attributed to in utero airway obstruction. And based on the level of obstruction, whether proximal or distal, so for example, proximal obstruction like congenital lobar overinflation or distal like bronchopulmonary, uh, congenital pulmonary airway malformation. Also, the severity of obstruction, whether complete like congenital uh, uh, pulmonary airway, mal airway malformation or bronchogenic cyst, or less severe like congenital lobar overinflation. Also, the timing of obstruction, whether early like congenital pulmonary airway malformation or late like congenital lobar overinflation. And we can see here a, a large a group of genes which may be included in this process. And nowadays we can say that how DICER-1 is very important, is very important and informative about uh, the presence of bronchopulmonary uh, blastoma or not and, uh, the, um, uh, and its relation to the above finding. So we are starting now with um, um, bronchogenic cyst which we can say that uh, it is the most common cystic lesions of the mediastinum. But it, uh, it can be present also in any other sites. It can be present intrapulmonary, it can be present intrapleural, or it can be uh, uh, retroperitoneal, it can be present in the neck, uh, it's usually present in the supracarina region or um, uh, below the supracarina regions or below the carina, and it's usually a thin walled with homogeneous fluid inside. Um, and also, um, uh, we can see here that this patient was diagnosed as right uh, middle lobe pneumonia, but actually, we can see that we have a well-defined cystic lesions in the mediastinum, and it was a bronchogenic cyst. And based on the, um, the size of the cyst and the presence of its adjustment to either bronchus or trachea, and based on it has uh, compression, whether this compression is partial or complete, we can say a wide range of symptomatology like cough, stridor, wheeze, atelectasis, and in some situations we may get hemopsis or hyperinflation and respiratory distress. 
Another patient with bronchogenic cysts, we can hear a thin walled enhanced mediastinal lesion, uh, fluid enhanced lesions, causing marked compression of the trachea. We can see here, this is a bronchoscopic finding of that patient causing severe anthroposterior compression of the trachea, and this patient presented with severe respiratory distress. However, this patient, we can see here that how, um, we can see this is the border of the heart, and we can hear here, um, a one-year-old boy with presenting with chronic cough and recurrent fever with wheeze, and we can see here um, tissue um, uh, uh, fluid enhanced tissue mass is present in the uh, supracarinal region in the mediastinum and causing pushing the mediastinum towards uh, 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 anteriorly, and how this uh, well-defined um, fluid enhanced uh, tissue mass with well-defined border it is a bronchogenic cyst. Then the uh, pulmonary sequestration uh, in which we have a mass of abnormal non-communicating pulmonary tissue. And this mass we had without normal bronchial communications and it has a systemic arterial supply, whether this systemic arterial supply from the dorsal aorta or sometimes from abdominal aorta and in very, uh, um, in, in sometimes we may get arterial supply from the intercostal artery or from the subclavian or any other systemic arterial supply. And this is very important for the surgeon because in very um, um, uncommon cases, we may get this abnormal arterial supply, which make a big problem during surgical intervention. The venous drainage is quite variable. We may get it to the pulmonary veins or in some situations to the adigos or hemiazygos. This is an example of the two types of sequestration where we have intralobar sequestrations uh, which, in which uh, within the visceral pleura of the lung and the extra lobar, uh, which uh, less common than the intralobar sequestration in which have the lung tissue here, he had its own pleural uh, covering. And um, the intralobar sequestration, which is the most common, is usually not associated with other malformations but the extra lobar sequestrations is usually associated with either diaphragmatic herniation, cardiac malformation, or forgot anomalies. This is another example of uh, extra lobar sequestrations, and we can here get the systemic arterial supply from the, uh, uh, from the aorta. Another example of um, uh, posterior basal uh, lower left-sided uh, sequestration, we can see here the systemic arterial supply from the aorta and how we can get it, yes. Another example. Then we are passing to another topic, which is the congenital pulmonary airway malformation. And however, in our practice, we have a changing definitions and the classifications of these problems. And uh, previously, we can say that um, congenital cystic adenomatoid malformations with different, with three types of classifications. Uh, but nowadays, we are class reclassifying it nowadays between uh, CCAM to CPAM. So we are changing C to P, uh, congenital pulmonary airway malformation. In the previous classifications, we have just only three types of classifications, but the congenital pulmonary airway malformations, now we have five types of classifications, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And over this table, we can say that how um, type 0 one, which is very less common or the least common one, which uh, just only in one to 30% of cases um, in which which is have uh, many uh, definitions or many classifications, we can say it assigner dysplasia or assigner, or assigner hypoplasia or aplasia. So all of this due to uh, gross arrest at the pseudoglandular stage and in which these infants or this newborn usually died within few hours even with full support um, and the lung is usually grossly lung, uh, lung are small. Uh, it is also called the congenital pulmonary airway malformation type 0. But the uh, type 1 of congenital pulmonary airway malformation, this is the most common form and it represents about 60 to 70% of all cases of congenital pulmonary airway malformations. It is usually large cyst, um, usually greater than two centimeter, it may reach up to 10 centimeter or even more, usually present soon after birth and depend on the size of the lesion. 
overlay presentations usually due to incidentally detection or sometimes complications. Um, it's usually single predominant one, uh, in, um, or sometimes uh, we have associated multiple small cysts. It's usually affecting one lobe in 95% of cases, and it may be unilateral in most of the cases, but sometimes we get multifocal with affection of both lung fields, and this is extremely uncommon or bilateral. Um, this is another CT of other patients with um, fluid um, containing uh, congenital pulmonary uh, airway malformation, and other patients with uh, all these of our patients in, um, in our practice in, in, in Alexandria University. And this is another patient with small thin wall cystic lesions in the left lung. We can see this is the CT of the patients that how we can a huge thin wall cystic lesions. Um, uh, however, we may get septation like that. Um, another patient uh, of complicated um, uh, CPAM type 1. However, the risk of association with bronchoalveolar carcinoma is extremely uncommon, especially in type 1. Um, it usually presents in older patients, even after surgical resection of the patients. However, type 2 is less common. It represents about 15 to 15 to 20% of the cases. Uh, the small, the CC are usually small and uh, about two centimeter. And the um, second most common form, it is usually single lobe affection. And type two is usually commonly associated with renal anomalies, congenital diaphragmatic herniation, congenital heart regions, and sequestration. However, in case of sequestration, the lesion here, here we can a, a systemic arterial supply, and this lesion is termed now a hybrid lesion because it. Uh, it has a hybrid lesions. This is an example of um, um, uh, CPAM type 4 with systemic arterial supply and what we can say here, um, uh, 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 hybrid lesions. However, type, le type 3 is entire loop affection. It represents its incidence between 5 to 10% of the cases. It sometimes causes mediastinal shift with compression of uh, the hypoplastic adjusted lung, uh, and usually this lesion is non-cystic lesions. Um, however, you usually we have severe um, respiratory manifestations and may survive if hypoplasia is not so severe. The problem with type 4 lesions, which is uh, presenting about 5 to 10 percent of the cases, uh, usually that uh, its presentation is exactly similar to type 1 CPAM. But the main problem is that it is much less prevalent and the similarities of between CPAM type 4 and the uh, prevalence of <coughs> bronchopulmonary uh, blastoma. However, the link between CPAM type 4 and the pluripulmonary blastoma is very, uh, is very interlinked with each other. And we have classifications of bronchopulmonary blastoma is um, type 1 in which we have a purely cystic lesions, type 2 in which we have partially solid, partially cystic lesions, and type 3 which is purely solid. This is an example of one of our patients with pluripulmonary blastoma in which we have partially solid and partially cystic lesion, and this is example like type 2. Uh, however, this is a very um, uh, 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 deceiving the CT finding in which many of the pediatricians or pediatric pulmonologists and sometimes surgeons may go past so without being that this is a pluripulmonary blastoma. This is another example of cystic lesions. This is purely cystic one. And then we passing to the bronchial atresia uh, in which in the past it was known as it is not yet well less common, but actually nowadays uh, we should know that it is one of the uh, uh, presenting um, very commonly and now become one of the commonest or even the most common uh, presenting uh, congenital pulmonary airway malformations. This is the gross picture of the uh, bronco bronchial atresia and we can see here that um, an enhancing uh, lesions in the epicoposterior uh, uh, bronchus com causing complete obstruction which is exactly similar to inspissated mucus together with hypoattenuation or low density of the epicoposterior segment of the left upper lobe 
uh, a picture which is highly suggestive of bronchial atresia. Um, this is definitely another yes. patient is congenital lobar overinflation in which we have a mediastinal shift uh, that causes shift of the mediastinum to the other side together with also epsilateral compressive or um, uh, compressive symptoms causing market compression and collapse of the uh, same side. The systemic arterial connection, um, which is one of the very important, important, it may be isolated or it may be associated with bronchial atresia. Here, what we can say, intralobar sequestration, or with CPAM, as we can say, what we say, hybrid lesions, or with extralobar sequestrations, which is a typical features. However, the surgical management or the management of, uh, of bronchopulmonary malformation, this is, will be left to the um, uh, the, our Professor Gelter, who will present the surgical management, but we should know that we have a debate about if we have moderate to severe symptomatology, I think that surgical intervention here is mandatory, but if we have asymptomatic patients, uh, here we have controversies. Even uh, we are doing surgical intervention or to pass through conservative therapy, and in both we have two opinions, um, both of them to be considered, and I think that this is, will be lost for the other, um, uh, 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 the, to the next presentations. And my recommendations in this presentation is to definitely, we are in need to define the anatomy and uh, clearly state nature of the airway, arteries, veins, and <laughs> before giving the lesion its name. And, um, primary importance of gross examinations, and also we should resist the impulse to name everything because we cannot sometimes doing the name for everything. Uh, then the appearance of the lesion changes over time. Definitely this change will differ between fetus, infant, older children, and adults. And so all of us, we should know that, even the taking the possibility of the complications. And also we should remember that the age makes the difference, and thank you, and I'm sorry for interruption. Thank you very much, Professor Nader. As for me, I can stay uh, listening to you and uh, studying for one hour, but uh, because we have a lot of audience, and now it is time for Professor Holger Till. Uh, professor Holger is a, a professor on the head of department of pediatric and adolescent surgery in Graz University, uh, Austria, and he is one of our best friends and the current. Uh, IBEG President, welcome on board for the surgery and management of congenital pulmonary malformations. Please come in. Dear friends from Egypt, first of all, um, Professor Sami Shehata, Professor Sheriff Shehata, thanks for this very, very kind invitation. I wish I could be with you in Egypt, but we all know that this pandemic is um, asking us for different strategies. Um, can you hear me well? Okay. Yes. And I hope the video works. Um, I changed rooms because everybody in Austria is now on the internet. <laughs> After this fantastic um, uh, presentation from uh, Professor Fassé, I will not go into the um, uh, talks about um, the indications and everything. Everything has been said so well that I will go right down to surgery. I will take about five or eight minutes for the basics and then uh, talk to you about two techniques. One is um, a rather simple so-called extra lobar PPS and then a lobectomy. But every time I give this talk um, about uh, sur surgery for pulmonary malformations, I think it is extremely important, especially for the younger ones, to stress once again that all of these lesions are so unique with their vascular supply, as Professor Fasse said, uh, each lobe is different, that the younger ones need to train understanding the lung. On the first sight, nobody really knows who is feeding whom and where is feeding what. Secondly, for the younger ones again, we have five lobes in the body and each lobe is different. You must study those. We all know that as surgeons that the lower lobes, the left and the right ones, are the easier ones. But when it, come, when it comes to the upper lobe, it's called the so-called D lobe. D stands for delicate or even death. Because the A2 artery 
arises in the posterior side of the fissure. It's not in the frontier side of the fissure. And somebody who is not trained well doesn't understand that. And again, the middle lobe is the mastery level. And I'll come back to that. Patient selection. We've heard the pathologies. I won't do that again. It's already been done very well. When it comes to surgical patient selections, please just remember, newborn surgery is mastery level. This is the typical picture of a two-day-old, two-kilo uh, body weight uh, infant with um, obviously a left um, lower lobes um, the CPM with cardiopulmonary instability. Now, this is not a beginner's case. This is probably not even the case for, for thor thoracoscopic surgery, special, except for maybe Steve Rothenberg and these super superheroes um, who can really do this. But other than that, it's mastery level, open surgery, careful surgery. The same thing applies to immediate emergency surgery in new, um, uh, immediately after newborn um, uh, on the mastery level. In my setting in Europe, we probably try to postpone surgery until the age of six months, maybe even 12 months. The only thing I appreciate is um, we've done recently a study about the so-called hidden silent chronic infection. We're looking at the pulmonary, um, lower pulmonary microbiome, airway microbiome, and it seems that there is more chronic inflammation than we think, but that's up to the next generation to discuss. Final saying about patient selection, the big cysts are the good cysts for the surgeon. You simply decompress and you've got all the room. Very briefly, port placement for thoracoscopic surgery. Most of us stand in front of the patient. This is the, um, the, the tip of the scapula. So this is a 533. This is a 553 approach. You need probably in your right hand a five millimeter instrument um, for all the energy devices you want to do. And then remember that the scope is usually above the fissure in the mid axillary line. And then depending on the lobe, you swing either upwards or downwards, whether you do an upper lobe or a lower lobe. This picture is thrilling most of us. Again, this is the same two old and day newborn with two kilo body weight, and which I did openly in this cardiopulmonary crisis. And what's really challenging now is in these fine, fine structures that you have a few, almost fused fissure. Fissures may be complete, partially incomplete, or totally incomplete. Whether you do it openly or thoracoscopically, it doesn't matter. You've got hook cautery to delicately sweep the pleura away and nicely dissect down to the structures you want to do. The ligature is fine. And in older children, only in older children, clamps or staplers are advised for the division of the fissure. I'll show you three brief videos. These are for the younger ones. Just for the technical aspects of doing it. Here's the hook for the fissure. These are 60 seconds videos only to get you started with the surgery. And you appreciate how nicely you can use the hook to divide the, to divide the parenchyma without damaging anything else. Especially in incomplete fissures, this is helpful. Once you know what you do, sweeping motions, and once you know what you do, so you, you aim down here to the pulmonary vein, and uh, this is obviously an upper lobe being done, you can nicely isolate everything you wanna see. So that's the first video about fissure and parenchymal division. Vascular control, extremely important, especially when you do thoracoscopic surgery. You have 30 seconds, if you damage a vessel, 30 seconds to save the life of the child. So better be slow, better be careful before. This is one of the key teaching. Create enough length. You can then ligate with either all of the different vessel sealing instruments, you have ligature, just right, clips, hemolox, or in only the larger childs, but then it is very clever and helpful and fast. Once you have it um, a stapler in there, use it for the bronchus and the vascular. Okay. Short video again, very short video. This is obviously an intralobar sequestration. The vessel is coming through the diaphragm into the lower, left lower lobe. Nice big vessels. 
scissor that doesn't cut. <laughs> and here's Steve Ruffenberg. He's doing a middle lobe, lower lobe, upper lobe, middle lobe, and just uses the just right three millimeter instruments. This is a larger child. This is the bronchus. This is obviously the pulmonary arteries. And I enjoy this, this hook technique where I simply lasso the vessels, then lift them up and then have major control. Big child, 12 millimeter stapler for the bronchus and for the vessels, white magazine, white, white, white for vessel control. And then of course, bronchial closure, Depends again on the size of the patient. I think the easiest is the five millimeter or the three millimeter clip. This is Steve Rothenberg again, and a very small, small child in an upper lobe. This is the him, uh, Arzegger's vein, upper lobe. And this is the same child you saw before from me, where we did um, the vein with the, bron with the stapler. And here comes the stapler again for the bronchus. This is the vein, this is the bronchus. And you sleep very well in these older children. Okay, so these are the technical skills you need, whether you do it open or you do it thoracoscopically. These are the technical skills you need um, to have on board um, to uh, go. And like I said, I'll just do two entities. These are the starter ones, the simple ones, the so-called simple ones. This is a really beautiful left extra pulmonary sequestration. This is the diaphragm. This is the left thoracoscopy. Once you move this little mushroom or whatever you think, you see um, just the particle of it, of vessels cruising through the diaphragm into the um, uh, sequestration. Be aware that these are hyperplastic um, vessels, but other than that, it is technically just a beauty. It's a beginner's case. It is just fascinating and everybody will be happy as long as you follow the surgical rules how to do it right. But like Professor Fassé said, it's a fascinating um, topic when it comes to um, uh, sequestrations like these. This is obviously a mediastinal sequestration. Um, the um, blood supply is unclear, despite all fine Im imaging. This is the aorta, this is the inferior vena cava. This is obviously something going into there from the vena cava. And here you see some arterial branches. Once you do those, Nice right. Let's see that one. We approach this one, the mediastinal mass from the right side. So this is the inferior vena cava. This is the lesion somewhere in here. This is the diaphragm. This is the left lower lobe. Pulmonary ligament already mobilized. You see the phrenic nerve riding down here um, through the diaphragm. For a while you think, well, is that the way to go? This is the esophagus. This is already the pleura of the right side. But if you get the techniques on board, stay with the lesion. And you slowly will develop an inferior vena cava, esophagus, uh, already pleura of the, left, of the left side, approaching from the right side and you slowly develop it. I hope the video is showing. Sami, video okay? Yeah, and, when, and then you ask yourself, well, where are those vessels? <laughs> and here they come. This is probably the venous branch. Nice vessel here. Actually, we had two of them to our surprise, and then you finally find the arteries. The, op the benefit for the child is obvious. How would you approach such a lesion um, openly? Well, yes, you could do um, left-sided thoracotomy, but that's deep down in there in the diaphragm. Yes, you could do a mediast and, and a sternotomy, oh, but that's a huge intervention, huge access to this lesion. And I guess it proves the point for, thoracos for a thoracoscopic approach. 
Okay. So my summary for the extra lower um, sequestrations is uh, these are beginner's cases as long as you know the anatomy and the vascular supply well. It's a usually an easy shot. Some of them are dangerous, but again, preoperative uh, imaging will take care of those. And finally, um, I'll take, go to the intralobar malformations. Again, I would like to stress my love for anatomy. How many arteries has the right lower lobe? I'll ask that question later. But obviously, the right lower lobe has the basal trunk and the superior segment A6. How many arteries has the left lower lobe? Only one. So on, already the, the lower lobes between the right side and the left side are different. And I advise really everybody who has not been trained extensively in um, thor uh, thoracoscopic surgery and uh, thoracic surgery to go down to one of these beautiful atlases and prepare every case before you do. So you have the A6 artery dangerously coming from behind. You have only one main bronchus together with the A6, the B6, and then you have inferior pulmonary veins. And the thrills for that surgery, which is a simple surgery, it's a simple slope, is that the middle arteries for the A and four and five on the right side arise exactly from the basal trunk. So they would come from here instead of here, okay? And these variations must be known. Good, other than that, easy lope, let's do it. And then we summarize everything we had. You take the hook for the sweeping motion to get the fissure. This is an almost, in, almost complete fissure, beautiful fissure. Part of the parenchymal dissection, you just take the ligature. It is a beautiful instrument to dissect and then seal. And obviously here you already see the pulmonary arteries coming. Again, we expect two arteries, basal trunk, and then the A6. You take your time, you try to get enough length. <coughs> Behind the arteries is always the bronchus when you approach it from the ventral side. And if you're not clear, you simply dissect into the parenchyma. You lasso it like I enjoy doing it. With this lasso, you lift it up get enough length, get it off the bronchus, and then clip it down. Like Rothenberg told us, only cut half of it to make sure that the seals are tight, and then you cut the rest. Second artery, A6, the posterior one, the lasso, gain enough length, Clip it well. Then you go for the pulmonary vein. That's the window between the pulmonary vein and the bronchus. You tie that one down, clip it down like you saw before, and all that's left then Clip, clip, clip is the bronchus. If you're not sure where the B6 bronchus is, again, two bronchus, main trunk and B6, then you move your way into the parenchyma. Forget about these little, little tiny air leaks. They don't bother you much. And once you make sure that on the right side, you're not damaging the middle of bronchus, right side, middle of bronchus, then you just do what you used to do and tie it down. Okay, I think with that, dear Professor Horger, you have three more minutes. Yeah, and I only need two. And um, okay. 
what does the literature say? Well, obviously, tissue trauma for, thoraco for thoracoscopic surgery um, is better than open, less tissue trauma. That's a nice study from a good friend, uh, Ki Long Wong, in Hong Kong with a nice group, which basically just so that the long-term pulmonary function test after thoracolobectomy is better than open. That's probably due to impaired muscular and uh, fused fissures, uh, fused ribs, sorry. And um, Steve Rothenberg proved very, very early that uh, even in small infants, such surgery must be done and can be done as long as you understand the pathology, like Professor Fassi said clearly, and you know the surgical rules. So in conclusion, dear friends, uh, thoracoscopic surgery or thoracic surgery for these pulmonary lung formations is a really fascinating area because of the high variability of pathologies and pulmonary anatomy. If you know your skills way, patients will benefit. And I think um, it is a nice area, a special area for us as pediatric surgeons together joining in the decision making with our colleagues from pediatrics. So I'm done, but one word, I miss you personally. <laughs> Wish I could be with you. Super thanks. Okay. Finish, finito. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Holger, for your nice presentation as Professor Fasir. And so can we, we can stand for uh, hours following, but this is the first uh, poll we uh, participant to take in. Yeah, the, for the poll, never use the ligature. Safety comes first. And uh, uh, actually now we will have uh, Dr. Ahmed Faris. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Faris is a professor of pediatric surgery and the chief of department in Fayoum University, Egypt. And he has, has a great experience and training from Cairo University. He will present the Egyptian experience in 15 minutes. Please, Dr. Ahmed. Take care. Uh, today I'm going to talk uh, um, about uh, our experience in Cairo University, uh, the hospital where I, I was trained uh, for the management of uh, congenital lung lesions. Uh, I will not go through um, the classification as uh, Dr. Nader have already mentioned uh, most of them, but I will show just a few slides. The name was changed as we all know from uh, CCAM to CPAM with adding of two types, uh, type uh, four and type zero, which is uh, actually uh, a rare types. Uh, the most fear, fear com fearful complication from CCAM that can present uh, after birth is the fear of uh, infection in 25% of cases uh, and fear of malignancy, which incidence between one to 2%, uh, that is the uh, pleuropulmonary blastoma. Uh, uh, also, th this is the picture of uh, pulmonary sequestration. Uh, this is the uh, uh, CT scan of patient with um, uh, bronchogenic cyst, which could be uh, uh, either in the mediastinum or in the lung parenchyma. Uh, regarding our experience in Cairo, Cairo University Children's Hospital, we have been managing uh, congenital lung lesions lesion since, since long time ago. But uh, uh, the cases that we are uh, facing, that we were facing, is uh, CPAM, congenital lobar emphysema or overinflation, mediastinal cyst. Um, uh, uh, as, as we are in the developing country, uh, we have a few antenatally diagnosed cases. Uh, this will affect uh, our um, management. Uh, so we don't usually face uh, non-symptomatic cases because uh, screening by ultra, uh, uh, antenatal ultrasound is not widely done for uh, during uh, pre pregnancy. So that, that will affect the, the outcome of, um, or, or, or the management of our cases. Usually all, all of the cases that we face uh, present with the respiratory uh, symptoms. And the age of presentation is usually older. Not, not all of the patients are present in the neonatal age, especially that uh, the patients that were asymptomatic. Um, also, the presence of uh, repeated chest infections in our patients uh, had um, caused uh, um, adhesions uh, between the fissure and between the chest wall, which makes the surgery uh, more difficult. We started uh, doing uh, thoracoscopic management of congenital lung lesion in Cairo University uh, in the past uh, uh, three years ago. Uh, this um, 
our, our experience with the management of thoracic surgery, uh, especially in the repair of uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernias and uh, esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula. Uh, also, our anesthetist team uh, are becoming more comfortable with the thoracoscopic surgery and management of um, uh, uh, CO2 insufflation in the lung. All these factors have encouraged us to start uh, thoracoscopic uh, uh, treatment of congenital uh, lung lesions. Um, before the era of thoracoscopy, we, we performed about 25 cases from 2011 to 2018. Uh, but recently, we had three, uh, five lobectomies. Uh, three uh, of them were completed uh, thoracoscopically. Two, one started uh, 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 open surgery because the, the new nate was distressed, and the other converted to open due to extensive adhesion uh, between the lung loops and the parietal pleura. Uh, we have uh, um, excision, uh, thoracoscopic excision of six mediastinal masses, uh, two uh, cystic hygromas. Uh, these hygromas were uh, uh, extending from the neck uh, to the chest wall. So the, the thoracic component was done thoracoscopically. Uh, and four bronchogenic cysts. In the early cases, we did it open, but two, the last two cases was done completely by thoracoscopic uh, uh, approach. Um, when we go to the, uh, as uh, Professor Hordel said, to the um, uh, anatomy of, uh, of the bronchus, uh, because we have, um, we have to study these uh, pictures where the artery comes and if the artery is uh, in front or behind uh, the bronchus, this is very important to revise, especially we are concerned with this revision before each operation. If we are going to deal with a lower lobectomy of the right or the left side, we, we study the group that will do the surgery, will study this anatomy and revise it uh, uh, importantly and correlate it with the CT finding of the patient to uh, uh, improve uh, the safety uh, during surgery. Uh, trocar site uh, is positioned uh, uh, according to whether it's upper loop or left loop. Um, I will show you a, a hint, a small hint about uh, the, the cases that we have mentioned. The first case we done was a seven uh, months old male. We did for him, uh, this is the CT scan of him, has a, a, a right upper loop uh, CPM. We did uh, right upper lobectomy. Uh, the patient uh, stayed for, in the ICU for two days and charged in the fifth post-operative days with no complications. Uh, the second case presented at day 12, he was a full term uh, with no associated anomalies. He had uh, a right upper loop uh, CPM. He was on oxygen, uh, nasal oxygen, but he has, we, we decided to wait uh, since the baby was stable. On day 20, the patient deteriorates and the cyst suddenly uh, enlarged in size, as we can see in this X-ray. Uh, he becomes ventilated, but all, we managed to do a thoracoscopic right upper lobectomy. Uh, third case uh, was diagnosed antenatally by ultrasound. Uh, the patient was asymptomatic at birth. However, a mild attack of the kidney occurred and this does not necessitate hospital admission. He was discharged on day two and operated on, on, day, uh, on the third month. This is the CT uh, scan. He has left upper uh, CPM. We did um, the surgery at the age of three months. It was a left thoracoscopic lobectomy and it was successful. And the patient uh, did well after surgery. Uh, I will show here the video done by Dr. Mohamed El Barbari. Uh, we used the, the Ligasure um, instrument. I hope it, is, it will be clear to divide the, the, the veins and arteries of the left upper loop. Uh, then the, the bronchus was uh, dissected carefully. Um, we used um, um, hemolux. This is, uh, we, we enlarged the incision because this is a 10 millimeter uh, hemolux. Then, uh, um, complete isolation of the left upper loop, and uh, uh, it was excited. The, the patient um, went um, 
have a very smooth post-operative course. Uh, the, um, the, the, the fourth case was antenatally diagnosed the male boy. Uh, he presented with respiratory distress at birth, no associated anomalies. One of the problems that we faced, um, the patient was distressed, so we decided to do open surgery. Uh, as you can see from this CT scan, this baby has a lesion in the left upper uh, loop and also extended into the lower loop. When we do the surgery, the cystic lesion was involving mainly the upper loop and a small part of the lower loop. With complete obliteration of the fissure, we couldn't demarcate between the upper and the and left lower at the start of the surgery. Excision was done for the upper loop and um, uh, almost the superior segment of the lower loop was uh, removed. We, we, uh, we confirmed that the, the lower half or the lower one third of the lower, uh, of the lower loop was ventilated uh, nicely at the end of the operation. And the patient has good uh, outcome, although he's, as we removed a large part of the, of the lung, he, he remained with um, uh, like a pneumothorax or something like this for a long time, but he, he went, uh, okay. Um, this is a, a brief account of our, our cases. We, we hope uh, that we, um, and in the future, we are expanding our work in uh, thoracoscopic uh, uh, surgeries for congenital lung malformation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for your uh, nice illustration of the short uh, experience from Cairo University. And now it's time we are uh, uh, inviting Dr. Aydin Yagmorlu. Professor Aydin is professor of pediatric surgery of, uh, in Ankara University. He is one of our best friends. He is the president-elect of the IBIG Middle East. And I have uh, the uh, honor to be his uh, vice president at the current. And uh, in the audience is uh, Dr. Ayn Amr Bouri, also the uh, current president of the IBIG Middle East chapter. And he will give the uh, talk regarding safety and complications of thoracoscopic intervention uh, in thoracic surgery. Ashakurei, Dr. Aydin. Thank you, Sherif. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be invited here. First of all, I want to thank the Egyptian Pediatric Surgical Association and the organizer for this panel. Um, and all of the speakers outlined very important issues on congenital lung malformations. And now it's my turn to talk about the unpleasant side of these delicate and advanced surgical procedures. Uh, I mean, the complications. And I'm going to talk about uh, safety issues in order to prevent these complications, which Holger stated very clearly that we have to be very careful. We have to know the anatomy very well, and we have to be uh, um, stick to the principles in order to prevent these complications. I have nothing to disclose. Um, what I can say that, that the traditional surgical approach to congenital lung malformations has been the open thoracotomy through the posterolateral way and open thoracic surgery at early age was found to be linked with later chest wall asymmetries, poor cosmetic results, and also scoliosis. Um, in 2003, uh, Steven Rothenberg was the first to report uh, the thoracoscopic lung resection in children. Um, as far as I remember, his group included around uh, 50 patients. Um, and the age range was between the neonates and up to the 18 years of age. And the smallest baby was around three kilograms. And since then, the thoracoscopic approach has been described as technically challenging. It's an advanced operation, but with reduced and short and long-term morbidity compared to the open surgery. Uh, in large patient collectives, thoracoscopic lobectomy has proven to be a safe procedure, especially in adult surgery. Uh, in the surgery of adults, however, a learning curve of the respective surgeon is clearly described. Uh, the same applies to the performance of thoracoscopic resections in also childhood. The pro problem 
is the fact that these procedures are carried out very often in thoracic surgery departments in adult surgery. And therefore, a corresponding experience can be gained quickly. In pure departments for pediatric surgery, however, the operating frequency is often not large enough to establish this method. So you have to gain much experience to do more cases, but these cases are really very limited. So this means that experienced thoracic surgeons operate the children at institutions where in addition to departments for childhood surgery, children's intensive care facilities are available. And against this background, the question arises whether the thoracoscopic lobectomy or thoracoscopic lung resections lead to measurable advantages in pediatric patients. In the review of the literature, a lower complication rate is found for the minimally invasive procedure than in the open surgery. And the average surgery time, of course, is much longer in the case of thoracoscopic procedures, but it's getting closer to the open surgery. And while the length of stay in the hospital stay is shorter in thoracoscopic surgery cases. Um, to minimize complications, we have to be aware of um, some technical difficulties. Uh, I mean, the technical difficulties in thoracoscopic operations in children concern surgical aspects and also involve aspects pertaining to the anesthesia procedure, which result mainly from the small anatomic size of the pediatric patients. And the main message is there are many anatomic variations. As Holger stated, the anatomy is very important, but there is also very much variations of the anatomy in terms of the arterial supply. And so always a broad dissection, a nice dissection um, is mandatory to perform a correct thoracoscopic pulmonary resection. And the first step is always controlling the arteries first, and subsequently the pulmonary veins, and then the bronchus. Uh, Holger and also Ahmed described the technical aspects of this advanced surgery in detail. So I'm not getting into it once again, but in order to minimize the complications, we have to emphasize some important steps. Thoracoscopic resection of congenital lung malformations can incur both intraoperative and postoperative complications. However, multiple case series have demonstrated a low incidence of overall morbidity and no difference in complication rates between minimal invasive and open approaches to resection. Uh, in the meta-analysis, I think Nasr and his friends made it, found a 21% rate of overall morbidity and 16% rate of respiratory complications. Most commonly, this most post complications is pneumonia. And the most frequently described intraoperative complication include hemorrhage requiring transfusion, uh, bronchial injury requiring repair, phrenic nerve injury, and incomplete resection of the lesion. And common postoperative complications include the pneumonia, and persistent leak or pneumothorax and need for blood transfusion. Uh, we have to state that additionally, while not a true complication, the most common and stated intraoperative event is conversion to an open procedure. Various centers report different rates of conversion. Um, it, it's ranging from 1% to 50%. And one established risk factor for conversion is the presence of preoperative infectious symptoms. And conversion rates are really lower in asymptomatic patients. So there became the question is, do we have to treat the asymptomatic patients? Do we have to operate them or not? This is an ongoing debate, so we can discuss this later. And other factors that may increase the risk for conversion are Procedures done early in the surgeon learning curve <clears throat> and patients less than 
five months or six months old. But there is a controversy regarding this subject. It's an ongoing debate. And in some reports, though multiple series have demonstrated high rates of thoracoscopic success in the procedures done early in the surgeon learning curve, which I don't agree, and the patient age less than six months or neonates. But in experience sense, it's, the success rate is really high. In general, the surgeon should consider conversion to an open procedure when he or she is unable to safely visualize, dissect, delineate, or divide the healer structures. And specific barriers to safe healer dissection include the pleural adhesions, aberrant healer anatomy, and incomplete fissure and hemorrhage. Sources of bleeding during thoracoscopic dissection include the intercostal vascular injury, inflammatory pleural adhesions, and injury to the healer vessels. While not immediately life-threatening, bleeding from inflammatory adhesions can result in acute blood loss, uh, and it, it, it may require uh, blood transfusion and can prevent the visualization of the healer structures resulting in conversion to an open procedure. Since there could be a huge variation of the anatomy, a broad dissection is essential following basic surgical principles. Healer vessels should be identified and controlled circumferentially prior to attempts at the division. So the blind division with a vessel sealing device is not recommended. For to avoid possible risk, the most safe method to control the arteries is to ligate them, as Holger demonstrated. Although it can lengthen the operative time, it's much safer and you can go and have a nice, good sleep at home, back home. Um, and you can use vessel sealing devices, but they may sometimes get sticky and tear the artery during the removal. And as most of you know, there are more delicate and smaller size three millimeter instruments for this purpose. And you can use titanium or plastic hemolocks in order to prevent the, to ligate the arteries or the vein. Um, they are not safe as much as the ligature, but you can use them. And never ever try to use a bipolar or monopolar hook battery to control the arteries. It's very important. Uh, and incidental injury to these vessels incurred during dissection or division can produce life threatening hemorrhage. Methods for controlling a vascular injury include the local pressure, which I think it's not very useful. Uh, you can make a suture repair, but if it's a huge bleeding, you have to convert it to open. You can ligate it. If you can be able to do it, you can do this. And these injuries often require emergency conversion to the thoracotomy. And there must be always a thoracotomy set, including the vessel clamps in handy. And also there must be available blood at the operating theater for immediate transfusion. And again, I want to recommend that do not hesitate to convert the thoracotomy in case of any suspicion. Dora where uh, the thermal injury, staple injury, or laceration to an adjacent or incorrectly identified bronchus or bronchial can lead to major morbidity, including complementary lobectomy. If uh, you identified it intraoperatively, you can successfully primarily suture the repair um, and put some pleural flaps, turn some pleural flaps in order to prevent the air leak. Um, or if you cannot do it, do not hesitate to convert to open procedure again. And um, of course you can miss the injury, you cannot see the injury. And the missed injury results result in a prolonged air leak and often sometimes necessitate reoperation for bronchial or bronchiolar repair. Um, one other problem is the risk of incomplete resection, and it depends on the surgical approach. I've seen that there were several questions regarding 
do you recommend segment tectomy or not? Uh, we can call them non-anatomic resections. These non-anatomic resections demonstrating a, approximately a 15% of risk of incomplete resection. Uh, but if you compare it to the formal lobectomy, the uh, risk of incomplete resection is almost zero. So this may be due to observed low sensitivity of contrast enhanced CT scan for identifying secondary lesions in the affected lobe. Uh, and in cases of residual disease identified on post-operative pathology, uh, reoperation should be considered to gain clear margins or to perform formal lobectomy, you can go and uh, make a formal lobectomy. And if residual disease is missed, uh, recurrent infections and the possibility of malignant transformation must be always keep in mind. Uh, in most case series reports, rates of persistent air leak and pneumothorax less than 10%, it's not so much. Uh, air leaks can originate at the bronchial staple or suture line, a, a transected bronchial or a missed injury to an adjacent bronchus. And small air leaks will often resolve with continued thoracostomy drainage. However, if the lung fails to fully expand or um, the air leak does not resolve, reoperation re may be necessary to identify the address, bronchial or bronchiolar injuries. And approximately five to 10% of patients develop post-operative pneumonia following thoracoscopic lung resections. Uh, the initial treatment is of course with intravenous antibiotics and while obtaining imaging to assess for undrained pleural effusions that may be become impacted. And any undrained collections that is observed during a CT scan should be drained separately and if there is a development of purulent drainage uh, it may require reoperation with a chest washout. To summarize, uh, these are my principles to avoid the complications. I'm always using the blunt trockers uh, to avoid the parenchymal injury in the beginning of the operation. And I always warn the anesthesiology when I'm entering the thorax in the beginning of a, of a operation if a parenchymal hemorrhage can occur, it will totally mess up the whole surgical pro procedure. And if there are huge cysts, you have to deflate the huge cysts first and then create space. You have to be very obsessive about the safe control of the vessels. So you have to circumferentially dissect it, isolate it, and enough length, and then uh, ligate it. Uh, you have to be very careful about using energy devices. Do not trust them. They cannot sometimes um, make a proper way. And never use a stapler without dissecting clearly the whole anatomy. Uh, we can use the staplers in older children, but the uh, neonates and infants we do not use. But you know, there, are, there is right now the five millimeter staplers, which cannot be used. And again, one other uh, recommendation is do not hesitate to convert the thoracotomy. In any case, in case of any suspicion, you can go directly to thoracotomy. It could be life-saving. And blood for transfusion and thoracotomy operative set must be ready all the time. So since the first description by Steve Rotenberg, in 2003, thoracoscopic lobectomy uh, for congenital lung malformations has been shown to provide decreased hospital stay and decreased time of tube thoracostomy when compared to the open resections without increased risk of perioperative morbidity. And additionally, most children exhibit normal long-term pulmonary function following resections. And the surgical technique continues to evolve with outcomes improving as surgeons gain more experience. And recent advances in minimal invasive instrumentation, including the development of these five millimeter endoscopic staplers and uh, just right the three millimeter ligature device. And these, these promises to address some of the remaining challenges of thoracoscopic surgery in small infants and also neonates. So to conclude, 
uh, thoracoscopic resections for congenital lung malformations are safe operations in experienced hands and also in centers. So thank you for listening and thank you for having me here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aydin, for your nice illustration and presentation. And now the whole uh, distinguished speakers uh, will be uh, interactive with uh, moderators. Professor uh, Dr. Akram Batarni and uh, Dr. Mohammed Debeki will uh, ask questions and you have to answer. And afterwards, there will be direct interaction by raising hands. Dr. Akram and Dr. Debeki, please take your turn. Okay, uh, thank you for all speakers for these uh, illustrative uh, lectures. Uh, we have um, a question, how can you differentiate between a primary congenital lobar overinflation with secondary mediastinal compression and consolidation pneumonia to other side lung from primary pneumonia of one lobe with secondary overinflation? Yes, um, this is a very good question because in many situations we have misinterpretation of congenital lobar overinflation. Actually, in case of congenital lobar overinflation, usually we can say two issues. First, you will get overinflation in one side, and this will have both uh, mass effect on the contralateral side with shift of mediastinum to the other side, and also on the same side, we get also uh, a mass effect. We can get compression reduction or some sort of consolidation collapse on the same side. And if this huge or very large overinflation, we can get this mass effect on the other side causing compression and um, a little bit consolidation collapse. But this is a little bit less than uh, the uh, on the epsilateral side. You will never get a consolidation as a consolidation because during your evaluation by high resolution CT, you can differentiate between actual consolidation and between the mass effect due to um, uh, collapse of the lungs. So we have differences between consolidation and between collapse. On a clinical base, we have definitely differences between um, auscultation wise when you have a pneumonia with consolidation like that. And usually if you have a consolidation, you will never have a collapse, yes? If you have a consolidation collapse, so you have an endobronchial obstruction in this situation on the affected side that will lead to overinflation on the other side. So you will never get a consolidation that will be associated with compensatory overinflation to the other side that will lead to mass effect. So if you have something like that, so you have an endobronchial obstruction, which lead to consolidation collapse of the right side, for example, that will lead to compensatory overinflation on the other side. And here you have an endobronchial obstruction, and this is not a classic pneumonia, as you can say. So the interpretation of uh, the condition all in all, usually you have... Um, there is uh, this, uh, this question, definitely you will never get a pneumonia with consolidation that you will be uh, misinterpreted. But if you have an endobronchial obstruction with consolidation collapse, it may be an associated with overinflation of the affected side. And uh, the, the frank interpretation, and in every patient with congenital lobar overinflation, we suggest that you are doing bronchoscopy before any surgical intervention for confirmation of the diagnosis and the exclusion for the other causes. There is a question uh, saying, uh, is there an intraoperative test before bronchial closure of the specific lung lobe? Take your left hand with a grasper for the, for the bronchus you want to occlude, and then you ask anesthesiologist to, inf to inflate. And if, for example, the middle lobe still inflates, you know exactly that you're doing the right thing. Okay, that's perfect. Another question again to Professor Olga Thiel. Uh, did you think still a place for vets when with open instruments during the learning curve? Yeah, I saw that question. Clever, yeah. of course. Just do what you feel comfortable doing. Okay? Mm -hmm. So to have a little incision and, and you put a five millimeter instrument in there openly, 
uh, to just make everything safer. This is absolutely in the benefit of the child and you do not violate any rules. There are no rules. The rule is safety, safety, safety. Mm. So good. Dr. Nader? I am friend of uh, how do you deal with symptomatic neonatal cases? Yes, um, definitely if you have uh, symptomatic neonatal patients, as we can say that you, we are in need in this situation to uh, wait and see that if these symptoms are due to the, you have um, a general evaluation, either you have a lesion, which is definitely have a mass effect that can affect or causing lung compromise with um, symptomatology. In this situation, you are in need for intervention even in the neonatal period. But we have many cases in the neonatal periods that they either have incidental finding or already prenatally diagnosed because the era now of prenatal diagnosis is uh, becomes a much, 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 much help help for us that we can estimate uh, how many patients that can present early in the neonatal periods. Many of the neonates have asymptomatology. And in these patients, we are passing conservative for these, for these patients till the, um, we make um, um, a, a communications with the pediatric surgery for the intervention based on the um, situation with each patient and the other. But when you have a symptomatology in the neonates, which is related to the pathology, because we have many patients who have symptomatology to something else. But if you have symptoms that is related to this, to this lesion, definitely you are in need for surgical intervention in the neonatal period. There is another technical question coming from Professor Nabil Desui. How you manage cases of extensive lesion of the lung involving nearly the entire lung globes on one side, necessitating total pneumonectomy, fill the chest cavity on that side, or you conserve one lobe, although it still have remnants of the lesion? That's, of course, a super, super rare case and a super difficult question. However, logically, um, every pathology must be resected. We heard this from Professor Nada Fassé, uh, about the complications, infections, and possible um, malignancy. Um, of course, you can do that uh, stepwise. Um, if my advice would be um, that lobe that is grossly affected must be resected, and then take it, and then maybe don't do both lobes or all three lobes at a time, but wait, because maybe at the end of the day, one lobe you can do a segmentectomy. So I wouldn't be brutal, I wouldn't be a cowboy. I would stepwise approach that child, do the gross lesion first, see what recovers, see how it recovers, and maybe aim for a segmentectomy in the remaining. Okay, staged, okay. There's another completion of the same of the question also from Professor Nabil Dusui, and how to manage bilateral lesions affecting certain lobe on each side of the chest, one stage versus two stages as well. So for a bilateral lesion, uh, it's better to do um, each one, uh, one side uh, at a time, mm -hmm. um, and try to convert the lung tissue as much as you can um, to, to do uh, uh, the level of resection down to the segmental level is better than total lobectomy and removing an, a normal lung tissue. Okay. And is there a role for thoracoscopy for metastatic lung lesions? Aiden, do you think, uh, do you have any experience with that? A role for thoracoscopy for metastatic lung lesions? Yes, you can do some metastatic lesions with thoracoscopic surgery easily. Uh, you can even do a wedge resection if it's in the periphery of the lung. Uh, but if uh, the metastasis is very uh, containing large areas, you can do go ahead and uh, make a lobectomy, but usually they're on the periphery and you can uh, make a wedge resection and you can remove them easily. You can do it. I'm ah. asking for if we have congenital pulmonary malformations, regardless the type of this malformation. 
in very few cases, and in, it is not common to get by-sided affection. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, we have one side is usually larger one, which have a significant uh, effect on the um, lung parenchyma, which may lead to definitely um, mm -hmm. symptomatology. And the other lesion is usually less sizable one with less effect. So do you prefer to work only on one side, which is the larger one, and then to stay for the other one to postpone or don't interfere till it becomes symptomatic? Absolutely, I agree with you. And do the larger one first, that is causing yes. the problems, and then wait for the other one and see how it recovers, how much parenchyma. It also depends on the age of the patient. We know that the lung growths until the age of about three or four years. So try to save as much lung parenchyma as that. I would like to, because I was asked, I would like to, com to comment on the um, um, uh, malignancies. I absolutely agree with Aydin. Absolutely. Mm. And I would like to add that a tumor is not a tumor is not a tumor is not a tumor. Um, even physically, when you have osteosarcoma or rhabdomyosarcoma, they feel like a rice corn. Okay. They are tough. They are light. They're easy to identify even during thoracoscopy and they are manageable. If you have a lung lesion from a hepatoblastoma, it's extremely hard to feel and see those. So um, the question to thoracoscopic approach for malignancy is every tumor is different and the this, this size and, and the location is mandatory. Um, let, let me be clear. All of us know these patients with, let's say, osteosarcomas. That is a systemic disease. They have nine or 10 lesions today and they will have nine or 10 lesions in a year. So what you need to do is save as much parenchyma as possible. I would honestly, with my true love for thoracoscopy, osteosarcoma patients, bilateral metastatic disease, I would do one, one sternotomy and reuse that. The patient's life depends on that. And then you take three out of the upper lobe, three out of the middle lobe, five of the left lower lobe, and so on and so on. So don't be too euphoric about thoracoscopy in tumors. Um, different business. Uh, same comment regarding uh, metastatic uh, lung lesion. I've learned it from my colleagues in uh, uh, National Car Cancer Institute that they depend mainly on tactile sensation that cannot be present during uh, uh, thoracoscopy. So they manage most of their cases uh, uh, by open surgery. Uh, to feel the, the, the masses that they are going to, uh, to, to remove. The Dr. Holger and Aiden, please, if you have a case of uh, two months age, do you prefer to do it at two months or the lower limit is six months with minimal CPAM? I can go ahead and answer. Well, yes. what we preferred previously was we were waiting the six months. Right now, we started to operate them when we gain experience. We start to operate them earlier. And the earlier, the anatomy is more delicate and more you can visualize the anatomy better and, and the heal better, I think. So right now, I prefer to do it earlier. I mean, three months of age. If, if the case at six months is smaller in size by follow-up than when it was at one month or two months, what you will do? Continue conservative or you shift on? Still a lesion, but coming smaller and smaller. Um, well, coming, if it's coming smaller, you can go ahead and um, do nothing if it's, if it's asymptomatic. But we all know that more infection, the operation is more difficult. So, it's an ongoing debate, again, in asymptomatic patients. To protocol, uh, Holger, please. If you have a protocol, until what age? Again, I agree with Aydin. Um, we usually wait, like I said in my talk, we wait until the age of six months. Yes. And before that, we only operate the severely symptomatic patients, just like Professor Fasse said. Um, but in some I understand situations, I'm sorry for interruption. No, no. I understand that uh, Steve Rothenberg and the literature um, is going down to 
yes, six months, three months, two months, immediately. Actually, I disagree with Stephen this point. Okay. <laughs> I am with you. No, okay. No, 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 he's he's the best in the world. Yes. So the best in the world can do things that I can't do. I just yes. have to admit my um, technical skills and, and match them to the patient. But again, um, in, in Europe, and, and I think that's the same thing in Egypt, uh, asymptomatic patients, um, there is no need to do it too early. We do understand the risk of silent infection, but I didn't say it clearly. Wait till six months and you're safe. But one of the very important issue is that the correlation between the size of the lesion plus the symptomatology and the most important issues is that we have in the newborn patients and the young infants that we have the process of pneumatization and the alveolarization is progressing. And so if you have a large lesion with compressed lung, so you definitely have some sort of pulmonary hypoplasia in this situation. Yep. For this large mass that causes pulmonary hypoplasia, I think that this is not good for the patient, so long as you are evaluating a large swelling with compressing and causing pulmonary hypoplasia for the affected side, even the patient, if, it is, if he is not symptomatic enough, I think that in this situation, the earlier intervention is a little bit better. But if you have no hypoplasia uh, and does not have without affection of the uh, hype without causing hypoplasia for the adjusted lung or the opposite lung, I think that you can wait. So I think that we have um, a collaborative team between the pediatric pulmonologist and between the pediatric surgeon or the surgeon in order to take the decision which may differ between patient and another patient. And you cannot put a unique rule for every patient because every patient is its own. Would you consider lung transplantation in advanced cases? Um, probably we should uh, listen to all of uh, our speakers. W when would you think of lung transplantation in advanced cases? Uh, and is it uh, available in your centers? I don't know, because uh, we are starting that very recent in Egypt and we didn't do any cases yet. The team is still setting up. So uh, I wonder if there is any in Austria or in Turkey. Well, I can say that I have no experience about lung transplantation, but as far mm -hmm. as Zafari is here, uh, in Ege University, they, they, they have some, I think, cases. Uh, and if Zafar can be able to answer it, we have some experience here. So do you, do you, do you refer any cases, any, any advanced cases that, that you think that it's... Uh, that will need to do lung transplantation because after resection, the residual is very low. Have you seen something like that? No, we had no experience about that. Okay, very good. And Holger? <laughs> I only know about one child with a complete tracheal agenesis. It's completely different topic from tonight uh, that requires uh, lung transplantation very early in life. Otherwise, that's a completely different um, profession. No experience. <laughs> uh -huh. Because even in the congenital diaphragmatic hernia with severe hypoplastic lung, it is failed afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> very interesting. And it's nice to see um, Holger and Aydin and everybody in there. Um, um, you want a comment about the transplant? We yeah. don't have any experience of the transplant and we didn't have any case to actually transfer it for transplant. And the transplant Excellent. is done at the Brompton where it's related to us, but we haven't had any cases um, to, try, uh, to uh, refer them. Um, I would like to thank everybody for the, the actual excellent lecture. Um, can I just ask um, Dr. Um, Nader, he mentioned um, that even after surgery, you can have malignancy. Is there any reported cases or is that incomplete resection of the actual uh, legion? The other thing is I would like to ask Holger, 
And usually, um, it's a fantastic um, presentation that he did. How you mentioned that sometimes you wait until the age of 12 months and your patient selection is very important. So in which cases you wait until 12 months instead of six months. And the other thing about the complications of um, the laparoscopic um, or thoracoscopic lobectomy or segmentectomy, have any, uh, either Holger or um, Aiden, uh, have cases of chylothorax following that? And then I'll stop here now. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, I can answer my um, the question directed to me. Yes, uh, Professor Dr. Monder, um, yeah. I presented two issues that we have. Uh, there is a reported cases of uh, I have no any experience except in only a case of pulmonary blastoma, in which uh, um, an infant from uh, Pakistan who visited Egypt and the cardiothoracic surgeon did. Um, an operative interference based on a CT report that he have a CPAM actually, and the CT report told that he had a CPAM type one. And uh, this patient who was three months old, uh, he did this operation and then the surgeon after doing the operation, he referred the case to me because they have a recurrence. And so when I examined the patient definitely from the first CT, he had a partially cystic, partially solid, or type 2 pulmonary blastoma. It is not a CPAM. This is the only one case that I faced it, faced it in practice, in my practice. Actually, because the yeah, yeah, yeah. cardiothoracic surgeon uh, uh, depends only on the report of the high-resolution CT without referring the case to a specialized personnel for combined diagnosis and the confirmation of the diagnosis. But as regards the literature referred as reported cases of carcinoma, which may be related to the CPAM or any bronchopulmonary malformations, actually I have no experience because most of these cases occur later in life, in old age, which is uh, not yet in the pediatric age, uh, usually at 40 years of age or even 45 years of age, in which the patient definitely lost his communication with the pediatrician. And actually, my series uh, is starting just only from 20 years uh, when I am collecting all the cases that I have from the cases of CPAM. So I have only experience for 20 years, which is not small, but not too large, uh, and actually not following the patients after that. And we have no communication with the older doctors. My part of the end. Thanks, Professor Dr. Monzer for this question, and I thank you. And um, concerning your questions, um, when do I wait till 12 months? I think one of the nice things tonight is um, the discussion uh, with this fantastic pediatric um, attitudes by Professor Nader Fassi. I mean, it's a teamwork. Um, you treat these patients uh, in a conference as a team, uh, together with the parents. And we know that there are so many hybrid lesions that don't have a clear yes or no, that yes. we wait until everybody is happy that surgery must be done in the asymptomatic cases. Okay, obviously the symptomatics must be done again in the same group as a team approach. But Munta, if there is a family that at the age of six months says, well, listen, he just started to crawl and he will walk tomorrow. Can we come back six months later? And it's a small lesion and nobody cares about it. Really, and then we wait because malignancy has been ruled out. So I don't mind waiting. I don't mind um, following Professor Nasi's path, which is individual decisions taking the family into consideration. Okay. What do you I do for uh, for chylothorax, delayed chylothorax? I then? Well, I have no experience about uh, even doing the thoracoscopic lobectomies, but we have observed one case uh, after resecting, during the resection of uh, esophageal duplication, uh, a chylothorax period, and with unsaturated fatty acid 
is and nothing promotes. Uh, it went well and it goes directly well and it disappears. Uh, but other than we had no such uh, experience about that. Agree. It's a rare complication for a lobectomy because yeah. uh, you must somehow get into the mediastinum or close to the mediastinum. Uh, can I just um, congratulate um, uh, Professor um, Fasih um, Nader? It's yeah. fa fantastic to have a pulmonologist who is in support of surgery. We had <laughs> <laughs> we we had some <laughs> some antenatal diagnosed uh, CPAMs or uh, pulmonary uh, malformations, which actually the neonatologist would not refer it to them to us, and some of the pulmonologists even are trying not a, a conservative management rather than referring it to us. Do you yes. have any protocol or how is, is it in Cairo regarding neonatologists and the pediatric pulmonologists? Alexandria, actually. Alexandria. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in, Alexandria. Egypt, in Egypt. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, in Egypt in general and um, in my university in particular, in which we have a very good communication with the pediatric surgical team. And so we have a very good link with the pediatric surgery and the pediatric pulmonology. But actually in the neonates, they are a little bit, they are focusing about, um, mainly about um, um, the main problems of the neonates, but they are not yet will fully aware by full details of the, um, the bronchopulmonary malformations in general. And many of them are lacking the details of these lesions and how to deal and to take the proper decision. And once the, the newborn or the neonates is asymptomatic or in the contrast, he may have other problem that lead to respiratory distress other than the CPAM or the congenital pulmonary aerial malformation because many units have neonatal problems with respiratory distress rather than the congenital uh, uh, bronchopulmonary malformations. And in this situation, they may get fast track for doing surgical intervention and we are not in need to do that in some situation. And I am frankly saying that we may have some interlink or uh, not yet well communication with the neonatologist and actually with the pediatric pulmonologist. Uh, I think that uh, we are in need in my university in a good um, uh, participation with each other in order to reach the optimal for solving this problem. I think that more awareness in the upcoming future, I think that will help much. But definitely we have a very good communication with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Holger, please go ahead. When it comes to congratulations, uh, I would like to echo and join <laughs> and congratulate Professor Ahmed um, uh, Fares and his group. Um, if I understood your Cairo case as well, you did an upper lobe, you did another upper lobe, you did another upper lobe, you had a case with an incomplete fissure. So congrats, absolutely congratulations to your skills, to your setup, to your preparations, because you did the most difficult. I think the next series should be 20 lower lobes and an easy day. <laughs> uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, chylothorax, uh, the question uh, regarding uh, chylothorax, uh, we have uh, experience with the chylothorax following, following uh, thoracoscopic, thoracoscopic repair of esophageal atresia because the, uh, the thoracic duct is uh, pa uh, passing um, uh, near the azygous vein. Sometimes it, we, we have one case that it was injured and that we, we managed to, uh, to control it uh, uh, conservat conservatively and the, 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 the chyle leakage stopped this with conservative treatment. I have one question regarding uh, um, the use of the new uh, contrast medium uh, uh, ICG in, uh, in detecting in chylothorax. 
have anyone experience with this uh, technique? ICG, uh, endothymine green for management of chylothorax. This is a new... Uh, or during globectomy even? Or during globectomy, this, this yes. I, I found this question. Holger, please. And we do ICG for varicose seals and uh, gallbladders, but I think it's a good idea. It could be tested. A couple of comments coming from Dr. Girzu Kian. She shared the shared the case report about the bronchoalveolar carcinoma of the lung and congenital cystic adenoma formation. So anyone who is interested can have a look on this. And she also gave a comment. Uh, for the friends asking about surgical treatment options for extensive bilateral diseases, uh, uh, you have the conservative option and there are algorithms for conservative follow-up. You can also check for DICER-1 mutation if you have the opportunity, just a suggestion. Um, and I think by that, we have uh, done most of this. And if there is a question also coming from what about cases of pleuromediastinal lesions that presented with neonatal respiratory distress that converted to be asymptomatic with follow up conserve versus surgical intervention? What do you think? All right, then. What's, what's actually meant by pleuromediastinal lesions? For it, he, he is not clarifying. Which mm -hmm. type of pathology, yeah. pleuromediastinal, which one, which type of pathology he is asking about? The question yes. is not quite well clear for not me. Clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I there think, another yeah. uh, repeated question, actually, when uh, Sharif Shahata was talking about uh, CDH, uh, mm -hmm. about separation of hepatopulmonary fusion during yes. CDH. Mm -hmm. So anyone, I think it's, it's rare, but anyone from the surgeons have seen a case or more than one case? Olga, Aiden, uh, Ahmed Farah? No? Uh, uh. I, by a personal communication, there is one with Darius, Dark, and he used the harmonic for a separation. Sometimes it's very difficult. And he is against Ligashur also like Holger. But he have only one case with uh, Darius Patofsky. Uh. I have one comment. I, I have seen one case with, of uh, uh, right side diaphragmatic hernia with a large vessel uh, traversing from the lung to the, to the liver. Uh, I, I did this, uh, this case open uh, by open thoracotomy, not uh, thoracoscopy. I closed the defect around. I, I tried to preserve this artery uh, and not to divide it as, it, uh, as, as I thought it could carry uh, hepatic venous drainage from the liver direct to, to, to the lung. The pro mm. problem, Faris, how you can close the defect without def dividing the fusion. It's technically uh, difficult or impossible, so you have to compromise. I didn't close it completely. I left, okay. I closed it. Yeah. Yeah. And Dr. Osama Nagar also mentioned that he has two cases of uh, pleuropulmonary fusion. Uh, there's a question mm -hmm. about, uh, is there a specific age below which you can use ligature safely to control vessels and also to control lung parenchyma in cases of non-anatomic dissection or lung biopsies? This is full Holger, the ligature. Yeah. You have <laughs> uh, This is too ideal for the complications. <laughs> 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 Aydin? First, well, mm -hmm. of course, most of you have seen how Steve Rotenberg was doing these operations, and he's not always um, using a ligature or clip to cut the arteries. He's using ligature, especially in neonates, and he's doing uh, these operations. I think he has been done these operations more than anyone in the world, uh, and he reported no complications regarding this. But I've seen some complications using ligature. I mean, ligature, the vessel sealing devices can, can get sometimes sticky. And when you try to remove it, you can tear the artery and it can make a huge complication, huge bleeding. So uh, I don't feel myself safe when I'm using the ligature. So I try to ligate or clip it before using the ligature. But I've seen Steve Rotenberg doing it safe and nothing happens but I'm not sure um, 
This is about the fourth, please. the fourth time. Clarify because you are against. Okay. <laughs> I didn't. I agree every time with you. Okay. Yeah, um, that, let me that's... just add. Um, the, the Rothenberg technique is very special. You have to watch him very closely. Yeah. What he is doing. He is doing two seals at least. Yeah. Yeah. Like clips and cuts yeah. in the middle. And when you hear him teach, he says those instruments like ligature that seal and cut in once are dangerous. So seal, seal, tissue in between and cut here is safe. And that you can do at any age downwards. Once the vessels get up to five millimeters, I would be very careful. Uh, but again, not one, the modern seal, not one seal and cut at the same time, seal, seal, tissue in between cut. Agreed? Yeah, we agree. And if you don't have enough lens, <laughs> well, don't make one mistake worse by another mistake. Okay. Eight enough lengths. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Nader, should, should all extra lobar sequestrations be rejected? And should all congenital lobar emphysema be operated even, even if there are no symptoms? Yes, so we have two questions. First question is um, or um, intralobar sequestrations or extralobar sequestrations extra lobar sequestrations are in need as you know that um, in many situations the extra lobar sequestrations are usually associated with other congenital malformations uh, so first you should interpret the patient well for the possibilities of congenital diaphragmatic herniation or congenital, uh, congenital renal dysgenesis or cardiac problems Actually, in many situations, we are not in need for interventional or surgical intervention. In most of the situations, but um, in some of patients, I think that a lot of pediatricians, that when they find the report, which incidental finding that he had um, extra lobar sequestration or something like that, he may interfere with I think that um, not all patients with extra lobar sequestrations are in need for surgical intervention, and you can wait and see for the possible time if we have a complications or not, or recurrent infections or not, or related problem or something like that. This is the first question. The second question is so much difficult to be answered. And I think that for many pediatric pulmonologists worldwide, this is a very big problem to take a decision when to surgically interfere with congenital lobar overinflation. Because we have a lot of many patients of such type of patients that if you follow them by age, you will get partial improvement in the clinical situation. So if you take the decision so early and you may, for incidental finding, the patient refuse to do surgical intervention and then to follow the patients, after many months or many years, you will find another situation. So you are in need for a long experience in order to check when to take a decision for congenital lobar overinflation. And actually, um, again, bronchoscopy is very essential in such type of patients for avoidance of doing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, ab, um, wrong diagnosis for evaluation of the congenital lobar inflation. But definitely when you have a frank symptomatology with severe respiratory distress, this is a sharp decision for taking surgical intervention, especially early in the neonatal periods and or even in the very few um, in the very uh, few months of life. But sometimes you may get an older child who came to you with X-ray or high resolution CT with congenital lobar overinflation without any past history before for having a big problem or chronic or recurrent chest problems. Just recurrent cough and wheeze from time to time, exactly similar for uh, asthma patients. Um, so if you have a large congenital lobar overinflation with definite contralateral and epsilateral mass effect, this is a um, frank decision for doing surgical intervention. Otherwise, if you have no contralateral or epsilateral <laughs> mass effect, I think that you can postpone for this decision based on the clinical course and follow-up of that patient. 
I got just that question, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Nader, about that. What about, what about the effect on the future athletic activity for those children? If they are still asymptomatic, would that hinder their, uh, their athletic activity? I mean, would it get worse if they start doing like uh, any form of, uh, of exercise and severe exertion? Yes, um, definitely after doing bronchoscopy um, in very different stages for such patients, uh, definitely we have bronchomalacia um, or segmental bronchomalacia for such type of patients. And this segmental bronchomalacia may improve by time or improve by age and they will get improvement of the clinical manifestation of the segment or lobar affection if you can justify this patient later on. And definitely we have no um, uh, research work done uh, what we are, we, we didn't know or um, do a research for doing pulmonary function testing for such a group of patients who are um, uh, seeking uh, or didn't uh, operate it upon in the early neonatal periods or even in young infancy and then uh, and, the t and the diagnosed late even in above the age of six years because you all of us know that we cannot do pulmonary function testing except beyond the age of six for the cooperability of the patients. And so um, actually I can't answer this question uh, because I have no any research um, to justify or document uh, if this patient can be affected or uh, they have an exercise limitation or have uh, some sort of obstructive um, uh, lung function uh, that can interpret or interfere with their full activities or not. So I can't answer, but I am uh, discussing in general about the symptomatology, the recurrence of wheeze cough or recurrent chest problems, but not actually not discussing the point of exercise. I think this is a point which are in need for research, which may be um, a point of discussion or point of research for me in the upcoming uh, few months. Waiting for that. Still one, one standing question, the, the use of Legasure for controlling the lung parenchyma, uh, alveoli and segmentectomy. Uh, do you prefer using it or using ligatures or clips for the surgeons? This question is for the surgeons. Dr. Holger? Ligasure is safe for parenchyma, as long as you use two seals. Yeah, you can Even for segmentectomy? Yeah. 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 Or stabler is better. If the child is stabler is better. <laughs> if the child is old, <laughs> old enough to get it in. Yeah. And Dr. Usama Nagar is raising hand. Thank you very much about uh, these presentations and uh, uh, these, uh, this very interesting uh, subject. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like uh, to, ha uh, to uh, I have a comment about uh, conversion. Actually, conversion in thoracoscopy or even in laparoscopy will not make the operation more easy. So if you are uh, obliged to convert from uh, thoracoscopy to a thoracotomy, you have to uh, ask for help because patients can die from uh, bleedings, especially in uh, these uh, delicate lesions and delicate patients. So the important thing is that we should not have a sense of security if we convert from thoracoscopy to thoracotomy because still the operation may be difficult and it will not be easy by conversion. This is one thing. The other thing is about the, uh, the uh, problem or pathology of hepatopulmonary fusions. I have two cases. Um, one case we suspected before the operations and we did or we have to do, and in these cases we did, a uh, CT scan and geography because the important things about, uh, uh, to, to judge about the possibility of separations of the lung and the liver is to understand the vascular anatomy, both the inflow and outflow of both parts of these fusions. So uh, by doing this CT and geography with 3D reconstructions before the operations, we were able to determine that both circulations are separate, and we use the ligatures to separate the lung from the liver, and we close the 
uh, defects. But sometimes you will have the hepatobulmer uh, fusions at the surprise that what happened in the second case and in these situations, we could not do separations. And what we did is that we fix the edges of the diaphragmatic defects to the uh, uh, part of the hepatobulmer fusions. And this helped us to prevent any herniations which, because in this situation, this is the only problem that we have. So we prevented herniations of abdominal contents into the chest by approximating the edges of the diaphragm to the uh, uh, edges of the hepatopulmonary tube. Thank you very much for the lectures and presentations, and uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Nabil is commenting in the chat area he has a problem with his mic. So his uh, comment is to yeah. give medium chain triglycerides in case of uh, chylosorax. This is a okay. good medical non-operative solution to the problem. So, yeah. okay. I think uh, now it's okay. No more. We have to thank all our speakers. Uh, Holger, of course, and Aydin. And it was a pleasure to have you all with us this time, Dr. Ahmed Faris and uh, Dr. Nader Fasih. Uh, we will have one panel in the uh, Alexandrina Bibliotheca with you, as we all know. Uh, all of you are invited. The same subject or another one, because we have common defended two times theses, one on congenital lumbar emphysema and the other was hyperreactive airway with reflux in children. We have uh, a pediatrician with surgical mind, so he is very helpful to Dr. Samah. And we all uh, uh, nice to have you and all of you have a good time today and stay safe. And thank you for participation in the EPSA uh, program. Thank you for see you in Hope a nice. To meet way. you in person soon again. How oh, for yeah. yes. yes. meeting is possible. Yes. Many thanks. Possibly Many thanks. everything is possible. Okay. Yeah. Bye -bye. Yes. <laughs> it's outstanding talks and uh, webinar, but but real meeting is something different. So thank you all. Yes, but yes. the next time needs to be a real meeting. Inshallah. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, thank you. Bye -bye. So. Bye -bye. See you. Yeah, bye -bye. Shukra. Thank, you all. Yeah. thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.